Hey, I'm Bruce Patton. I'm the curator here at the Savoy Automobile Museum. Welcome, everybody. Is it anybody's first time here at Savoy? Uh, all right, welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, who, who also has been here more than once. Really appreciate you coming. We have an exciting program for you tonight. You'll notice that we kind of changed the time because we know it's going to be a full program, and you guys will want to... Uh, have a lot of questions, and at the end, you'll probably want to get pictures. So we tried to think about that when we moved the time 30 minutes earlier than normal. So um, what I'd like to do is talk about our current exhibitions that we have. Hopefully you had time to go see the Rolling Sculptures, the Wooden Wonders, Wayne Cady's, uh, the GM Designer exhibit, and then <clears throat> our Savoy Collection. But I know you're here for what's in Chip's garage, and so hopefully you're able to go see that. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Honest Charlie's for uh, supporting uh, the uh, exhibit. So thank you very much. Um, also, I won't go through all these, but uh, go to our website and look at what we have coming up next. So as you know, every month we have a new exhibit. So hopefully you can go on there and see those. Uh, also, want to remind everybody about our movies that are here in the theater. So those are always fun to come and see the movies. Uh, they're kind of in order, so you can kind of go through those. Also, again, I want to try and give as much time as we can for this program. And so what I'd like to do now is introduce our moderator, so Ken Gross. So a lot of you know Ken. Ken's here, uh, like I say, Every time, he's really part of us. He's a Savoy uh, employee, as far as we're concerned. Uh, so, <laughs> so those who don't know Ken, I'll give you a little bit of history. He was the executive director at the Peterson Museum. Much shorter than all that. Yeah, yeah. Short, short, short. Okay. So anyway, I'll, I'll just give it over to give it over to Ken here. So, I'm just sparing enjoy. you because you've all heard it. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks. Enjoy. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks so much for coming. I think this might be the largest crowd we have had, and uh, it's no surprise because we've got Chip Foose with us tonight, and I could probably spend a, uh, most of our evening talking about Chip. Um, I wrote a statement down. Normally, I like to kind of ad lib things, but uh, I think Chip is the single most talented and prolific car designer and builder, period. And Amen. <laughs> we're, we're so fortunate. Well, thank you, but there's a lot of other designers that might argue with you. <laughs> well, they're not here tonight, so they're not going to have a well, chance. Wayne's here. <laughs> well, fair enough. Um, Chip is the, uh, without going through thank all you. that up there, I, I truly mean that. And uh, Chip was the youngest uh, inductee for the Hot Rod Hall of Fame. He's, he doesn't look it, but he has been involved in this business for over 30 years. Longer and, than that. <laughs> and, uh, well, over was, the, was mm -hmm. the, the operative word. So I always have to remember to click the buttons. I know you, you guys aren't going to do that. So I, uh, I just, I really have to. Chip, you began working with your dad at age five, six, seven, I think. Right? Started sitting next to him when I was three years old, started going to the shop with him. Well, I would go to the shop when he worked for Gene Winfield back in the 60s. I would go to the shop with him on the weekends. And then he opened his own shop in Santa Barbara, and I started going to the shop with him in, uh, I think I was, I was seven years old. So in 1969, I That's going to the shop with him. That's Sam uh, next yep. to... Uh, uh, chip in that, in that. You know, before we get started, I, w I would love it if we all give a round of applause to the Savoy for having us all together and for bringing my cars here. Fair enough. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's truly an honor to be associated with the Savoy and to have my vehicles here. And thank you to uh, Corky and Teresa for helping sponsor this with Honest Charlie's. So tell us a little bit about starting, really, as a child, <clears throat> working for your dad. What, what inspired you, and what sort of things did you do as a, as a youngster? Well, like I said, I don't remember being introduced to this industry. I was born into it. So my father worked for Gene Winfield, and 
I remember going to AMT, which was the name of the shop at that time. So if you remember the plastic AMT model kits that you could assemble, well, at Gene's shop, they were building the full-size cars that became the plastic model kits. So on the weekend, I would, I would be at the shop and I would watch my dad and the crew build these cars. And you know, about eight months later, my dad would bring home a plastic model kit of what they had built. And I got to assemble the plastic model kits. And you know, of course, I had glue all over the windows and everything else, but, uh, but that was my childhood. And the other company that was building replicas of the cars they were building was Hot Wheels. So as a kid, I had Hot Wheels in my pockets of the cars that I watched my dad build and I was building the plastic model kits. So I'm still living my childhood, you know, building these cars. <laughs> and I was fortunate enough to uh, go to Art Center College of Design and get a degree in industrial design. So we're looking at a photo of, uh, of you and your dad and it interesting trophy would you tell us what that is <laughs> that trophy is one of the america's most beautiful roadster awards and that was i believe the uh in 2000 when i i took a car that i had designed and built when we were at boyd's originally i had designed it for myself and that was the boydster 2 it was a yellow car with yellow interior and another uh, you know in the the bankruptcy of boyd that car was sold and then gentleman that bought it, Chuck Fados, he called me and he said, I heard rumor that this was your car originally. I said, yes, it was. He says, is it everything you wanted it to be? And I said, well, it's a great car, but originally I was gonna build it black with a soft removable uh, top that would lift off. And I wanted to do a five spoke American style wheel with a real knockoff on it. And he says, well, if I send it to you, will you build it that way? And I said, I said, don't, don't destroy that car. I said, let me just build you a new one. And he says, no, no, no I, give me a price and, and I want to send this car to you. So he actually sent it to me. I gave him a price and we built it. And four days before the Grand National Roadster Show, I was thinking, I could probably get this done and take it to the show. So I called Dan Sear, who owned the show at that time. And I said, hey, Dan, I'm finishing up this Roadster. Uh, do you have a space that I can put it in the show? I'd like to compete for Amber. And he says, sure. So I called, there's another builder, uh, Steve Mole. And I called Steve and I said, hey, Steve, do you have a display that I could borrow? He had a display that we could borrow. And I said, do you have carpet? Or, or he told me that he had the display, but he didn't have carpet. So I called Roy Brizio and I said, do you have carpet? And he says, well, we're going to the carpet store on the way to the show, so I'll get your carpet. So there was three of us that showed up, one with the carver, one with the display, and we were fortunate enough to win America's Most Beautiful Roadster Award that night, and that's when my dad was there and we took that picture. The amazing thing is Chuck Spados, who owned the car, you know, we, they give the award out Sunday night. We finished putting the car away and we went to Denny's at 4 a.m. <laughs> and we're sitting in Denny's and he says, well, what else are you working on? He lived in New York, he had never been to my shop, he just sent the car, and then he flew out for the show, and we're, we're having our pancakes, and he says, what else are you building? And I said, well, I'm building the cousin to your car. And he says, well, what's the cousin to my car? I said, I'm building a 32 five, uh, three window that I'm doing exactly the same colors and everything that I was, I was doing to yours for myself. And he says, a coupe? He says, well, I'd rather have a coupe in New York. He says, why don't you take the Roadster? And I said, I have to finish three other cars before I can get to the coupe. I said, why don't you wait? And when I finish the coupe, if you want to trade, I'll trade you. And he says, we'll see. Well, three days later, after he had flown home, I get the title to the 0032 that we had just won. And he says, he wrote me a letter. He says, I love billing him. He says, I don't, I don't want to drive the finished car. He says, the Roadster's yours. I want the coupe. So, so I owned the Roadster and, and, and I was renting my shop and the gentleman that I was renting from, he had the, you know, the parent lease and I was just renting part of the shop from him. And he comes in one day and he says, uh, the owner's selling the building, we got to move out. And I'm thinking, I've got no place to go. So I said, who's the realtor? And he gave me the realtor's name. Now I didn't have two dimes to rub together. But I called the realtor and I said, uh, how much is this building? And he says, well, we've got an offer we're, that we're thinking of accepting. They, they offered 265,000 for the building. I said, I'll give you 285. 
He says, oh, okay. Then I get into a bidding war on, on the shop, and I ended up winning the bid at 465000 <laughs> I didn't even have enough money to move the shop, but I had this roadster. So I took the roadster up to Monterey to RM Auctions, and we sold that roadster, and I got the money to put the deposit down on the building, and I put 150 in an escrow account that I could use to build the coop, and I finished the coop for Chuck's Fados. But every single sign that I have ever made for a car that we built at Foos Design, I always do one sign that's about the details on the car, and the other sign is, I call it the team. And Chuck's Fados name is on that team card for every car that we ever build, because without Chuck's Fados, there wouldn't be a Foos Design today. So you, you have won, which, what a, a neat story, isn't it? Um, you've won eight Amber Awards, America's Most Beautiful I've Amber built Award. eight, but I've been involved with four others that have won. And, uh, and four Riddler Awards. Yes. So for those who, don't, uh, who may not know, uh, the America's Most Beautiful Roadster Award is the, the California uh, Award started at the Oakland Roadster Show. It was just last weekend. Right, and, uh, and the Riddler Award, which usually isn't a roadster, is in Detroit. How, what's the competition like? How does it differ for those, uh, those events? The same kind of pressure, perhaps? It's the or? same kind of pressure, but the way that I've always put it, you know, it, it, at the Riddler Award, I always say that the judges look at, there's usually eight cars that, that end up getting selected to be the top eight, or I think they call them the grade eight, and the judges go over those cars with a fine tooth comb. And I always say that they look for the worst two inch square on the cars. And they go over the cars and they find the worst two inch square. And whichever car has the best worst two inch square is the winner. <laughs> and we've been lucky enough to have that best two inch square four times with cars that we've built at Foos Design. So not as, cra I've been an Amber uh, judge myself, not as crazy for, the, for Amber, more aesthetic, well, more? This is, the Riddler, I always say, is based on what you did and how well you did it. Mm -hmm. And it used to be that way at the Grand National Roadster Show for the Amber Award, America's Most Beautiful Roadster. But they've changed the judging, and now it is actually, it's, it's an opinion, which in my mind is much tougher to, to win. Because now, let's just say that the top eight cars there's a picture on the wall of all eight cars, and there's judges in a room, and the judges are looking at these cars, and one says, okay, what's everybody think of this car? And, and one judge says, I don't like low-profile tires. And another judge, you know, they, they go to another one, and the, and the judge says, well, I, I don't like those taillights. And they go down the line, but there's a car that's just an absolutely beautiful, traditional car, and nobody has anything bad to say about it, because everybody loved those. That might be your winner. But that could be a car that you know, has far less work than something that somebody completely hand fabricated. So that's a difficult, you, there's no target on the wall. So I've had customers that, that call and say, we'd like to build a car and go win the Amber with it. I can't promise you that I'll win it. But I know that in the past, I felt pretty confident in what we were building. So it's really difficult because now everybody has to agree what is America's most beautiful roadster. I can it's add, a much tougher award to win now. Well, and I can add one thing to that. I've judged at Pebble Beach for 33 years. Mm -hmm. And when I judged at the Amber Award, they put us all in a room, they had the pictures on the wall, and they served pizza and beer. They don't do that <laughs> at Pebble Beach. After a couple of beers, you know, it's really tricky who's going to mm -hmm. win. But, uh, it's yeah, one judge could say, I don't like that color. Yep. And that car's out. This is a new clicker, everybody, so uh, bear with me. <laughs> Uh, we talked about uh, your starting out at a, at a really young age. Um, you're, I think you're wearing a jacket there that was part of... That's, my father's shop was called Project Design, and that's his jacket. That, I would think, is probably about 1973, 74. Mm -hmm. That was the jacket. And then the center photo is when I started my business, the <laughs> upper one. <laughs> and then the far right is before I could afford a two-wheel bike. And then the bottom, that's, that's one of my custom bicycles that I built. I was probably nine, 10 years old there. So I'm, uh, I'm curious because unlike most designers, you are a mechanic. 
you're a welder. I mean, you can do it all. And Thank how, you. Does, how does that help you, uh, do you think, uh, in you know, it, the success it, you've had? It can be a help and it can be a hindrance when you're a designer. Because when you know how to build things, you draw what you know how to build. And I've worked with other designers that do these fantastic, fabulous drawings. And I look at it and I'm thinking, how's he going to open that door? <laughs> or how is something going to work? So it, w it was interesting. Uh, I, I actually interviewed at Ford for a job. And, and uh, I forget who it was. Keith. Jay Mays? No, it wasn't Jay. This is way, way before Jay was there. Mm -hmm. But um, Keith Teeter. Mm. I think it was Keith Teeter that was there. And he looked at my drawings and he says, you draw what you know how to build. And, and I knew then that, yeah, okay, I'm not getting a job here. But later I ended up working there. <laughs> it, I, I gotta tell you a fun story. Good. Uh, when I graduated, uh, Andy Jacobson, who was the head of the Ford Truck Studio at the time, he offered me a job, and, and the company that I worked for paid for me to go back to school. And I had 14 job offers when I graduated, but I said, well, I promised my boss that he paid for me to go to school, I'm going back there. But I did some professional interns, and I went to Ford to the truck studio, and I worked with Andy Jacobson, and it was an absolute dream to go back there and work with him. It was something that I always wanted to do. But when I got there, I went down, they told me where to go to get all my art supplies. So I go down to this little window in the wall and I order everything and he puts it all in a box and I pick up the box and turn to walk away and the guy says, where are you going? I said, I'm going back so I can start drawing. And he says, you can't carry that box. And I, I laughed, I said, it's not that heavy. He says, <laughs> he says no, no, you, it, it's a union thing, you can't carry that box. So I put it down there and he says, you can carry what you can carry with one hand. So I grabbed what I could carry with one hand and I went back to my deal and I sat there for about 45 minutes waiting for my stuff to get there. But the guy in the cubicle next to me had his pencil sharpener, electric pencil sharpener, all in pieces on the, on the desk and he was filing on part of it and then he put it all back together and I, I didn't look over there but later I look over there and it's all in pieces and he's filing on something for three days. You know, I got my stuff and I started drawing but for three days he was taking his pencil sharpener apart and together and I'm working on a drawing and I go, yeah, I did it. And I turned, his name was David. I said, David, what'd you do? He says, I balanced my pencil sharpener. <laughs> and he put his pencil in there and it, it wouldn't vibrate. He says, it won't break the lead anymore. And I said, how long have you been here at Ford? He said, I've been here 26 years, three months, eight, you know, <laughs> eight days and four hours. And I'm gonna retire in <laughs> four years. This, uh, and I, uh, right then I thought, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, it's, I have been blessed to be able to work with the automotive industry and the manufacturers. And it's interesting, you know, I grew up in the aftermarket world and building hot rods with my father and with Boyd Coddington. And I can go to a good guys event and I might see a car that I built with my father 35, 40 years ago. And the same owner still has it. He absolutely loves it, adores it, cherishes it, takes care of it. It's part of his lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I get to share those memories with him. We might go get something to eat. That is a lifestyle, yep. not a career. Right. And then I'll, I get to design these show cars with the manufacturers. And then I don't get to put my name on it, but I, I got the pleasure of being involved with it. Having created it, yep. But then it does one season going around to all the show cars and then it gets put away and, and then you never see it again, unless there's some event. But that's what I love about the aftermarket world and building show cars and hot rods. And you know, this is, you're making people's dreams come true. And I absolutely love that. Can we talk about your sister, Amy, for a moment? Sure. Amy is, uh, she's on the left there. That was her, is it working? It ended. Hello, there it is. That was Amy's winter formal for her uh, junior high school uh, dance. I was six years older than Amy, but I went back so I could take her to her winter formal. And Amy had what's called progeria, which is rapid aging. So she's 15 years old there. She's three feet, two inches tall, and weighed 26 pounds, but had a heart the size of America. 
everybody that met Amy would absolutely fall in love with Amy. And, uh, you know, her best friend was John Stamos. He was a drummer for the Beach Boys. You know, he, he could drum, and he would sit in once in a while at concerts. My older sister was friends with some of the new members of the Beach Boys, and we went to a, uh, a Beach Boys concert in Costa Mesa. And John Stamos was there, and he was sitting in playing some drums. But he met Amy at the concert, absolutely fell in love with her, and I would do anything for John Stamos to this day because for four years, he took Amy to every one of his filmings. He would take her to Disneyland, to Knott's Berry Farm. He just made her feel so special. And uh, I, I really appreciate and respect what he did for Amy. Well, and you, you've done uh, work uh, to raise money for progeria research. Uh, right. Is there any, is there any hope in, uh, uh, well, it's amazing what uh, Progeria Research Foundation has done. When Amy was born, they weren't around. They, she had passed away before they existed. But uh, two, two parents that had a son named uh, uh, Scott Burns, um, when he was born, they, they discovered what it was, but they didn't know anything about it. Well, they created the uh, Progeria Research Foundation, and they have isolated the gene that causes aging. And they have helped, it, um, Sam Burns, I'm sorry, it was Scott, is his father. Sam, when I, when I used to see him every year, Kevin King from year one would do a car show. And we would go in and, and uh, Sam would come to the show. And they started a clinical trial because they discovered a drug that, that might help this. And you know the kids were always just the same size and I see I see Sam a year later, and he was, I'm guessing, four inches taller, and I don't know how much he weighed, but I could tell he was growing. And I said to his, his dad, I said, how much has he grown? What, what's he, and during clinical trials, they can't give you any information. He says, I can't tell you, I can't, you know, it, it, during the clinical trial, I can't give out any information. So I turned to Sam and I said, Sam, do you have any new clothes? He says, all my clothes are new. <laughs> uh, but he was an inspiration, and Amy was my window to that. But, you know, having her in my life, I understood that we need to appreciate what we have, that we're normal. You know, she was taken so early, and what I always wished that she could experience was true love. And... She had true love from all of her friends, but I knew that she would never experience having somebody to fall in love with and get married. And for every one of us that has somebody in our lives that is that true love, we are blessed. Mine's right here, Kathleen Jewell that's sitting with us tonight. Uh, before we get into a lot of the cars, um, Tell us what we're looking at here. That, is that an airbrush? Or, uh, <laughs> no, that's that? actually, I'm a student at Art Center in that, the photo on the left, and Bern Hogarth was the instructor, and he, he said, I want you to do a self-portrait. So that's just a small picture of a self-portrait that I took, and what I ended up doing is I did this illustration of myself, and he says, I want it to be in a... Uh, in a humorous manner. So that's an electric eraser. And in my left hand, I'm holding what's called an eraser shield. Mm -hmm. And what I did is I, the eraser shield are acrylic, so you can see through them. And what I did is I took that picture and I, I drew the eraser shield large so you were seeing through it. And on that electric eraser, I got rid of the cord and I drew a Keith Black all aluminum Hemi on the eraser, so I was erasing big mistakes. <laughs> and that was my self-portrait. The picture on the right, I was working for uh, Rod Action Magazine at the time, and Steve Anderson, mm -hmm. when he was there, he took that picture while I was doing some illustrations for the magazine. And that would have been 1986 on the right. The one on the left is 1984. Did, was Strother McMinn at Art Center when you yes. were there? Yes. Oh. And it was, he, was, he was a friend of mine, and <laughs> yeah. you can probably spend some time talking about Mac. We're not. Oh, Struther was phenomenal. 
Mm-hmm. I, I learned so much working with Struther. And the first day we were in there, he brought one of his models. And he sets it on the table, and everybody's looking at it. And I said, is that tobacco brown from Mercedes? And he looked at me and says, how would you know that? <laughs> well, my 34 is that color. <laughs> so. I didn't know how interested he was in hot rods, but he had an, an over and under Leica, and he went around Los Angeles in the 50s taking mm-hmm. hot rod pictures. So a number of years ago, a friend of mine found some of his photos, and we put together a book of 100 of his illustrations. Oh, that's cool. I was always afraid to say anything about hot rods to him because he was a 30s classic mm-hmm. uh, guy, but turns out he, he liked hot rods too. Well, you know, when I went to Art Center, it was taboo to draw hot rods or muscle cars there. They only wanted you to focus on the future of hot rodding, which is ironic because then my senior project there, I did the Prowler. (laughs) And and we'll talk about the Prowler when we've got the right pictures. I definitely want to do it. Let's skip over for a moment to uh, Mr. Coddington here. There's happy days with Boyd. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what he was like to work with and, uh, and how, how you two work together. I mean, Boyd, you're the, the visualizer and builder. Boyd, I guess, an imagineer of sorts. How did that partnership work? Boyd was like a second father to me. I had so much fun working with Boyd. You know, it, it was a dream job because I could just come up with an idea. I'd do a sketch at home that night I'd come in the next morning and say, well, what do you think of this? Go build it. <laughs> you know, and, and a lot of the cars that we built there, he would find the customer for it. We would just get started on it. But uh, you know, Boyd didn't work in the shop himself. He was a maintenance man at Disneyland before he started building cars. got into building cars. He, right. he met John, John Butera mm-hmm. and took what John was doing and turned it into an industry. And I remember uh, the story, John was building wheels for his one-off cars, and Boyd said, we should produce those. And John said, what are you gonna sell, like 10 sets? And John was going on vacation, and uh, Boyd said, well, if if you don't mind, can I start? He says, I'd like to to build these wheels. He says, you can do it on your own, I'm not interested. So Boyd went to talk to Ray Lipper, who had centerline wheels, and he bought outers, and then he had his crew starting to build centers. And when little John came back, he had like 250 sets that he was building on the, you know, he was only gone for a couple of weeks. Mm. And then uh, Alan Budnick, Budnick Wheels, Alan came in from the military and told uh, Boyd, we don't have to build all these one at a time by hand. We can use CNC, computer controlled uh, milling machines. And he brought that to Boyd and it, it Change the wheel industry forever. The rest, the rest forever. is history, as they, as they say. Could yeah. Boyd sketch things, or was he more? No. no. Nope. Uh, he, he would have ideas, or, or the customers would come in, and I would meet with the customers, and they would talk about, well, I'm interested in doing this or this, and, and I would do sketches. We'd get a, uh, just from four or five sketches, they'd say, well, I really like this front end. I, want, I like what you're doing on the back. Or Boyd would just tell me, you know, and from those, we would come up with what the final illustrations were going to be. Or Boyd would just say, draw a 33 for me. And it was interesting where the Boydster came from. Mm -hmm. That was, I'm in the shop one day and uh, Pete Peterson, our truck driver, he comes in with a fiberglass 32 Roadster body and he sets it in the shop. And I'm thinking, I don't know of any customers that wanted that. So I said to him, I said, what's that for? He says, Boyd wants it for a shop car. So Boyd came in later that evening and I said, what are we doing with this? He says, oh, the body is a new b- company that's building this body. They gave it to us, so we're just going to build a shop car. He says, that's the frame that Larry's building right now. And I said, and we had just finished building a all-steel 32 Roadster for Frank Curry of Curry Industries. Curry. Mm-hmm. We made the changes, made the doors longer, and that was Marcel's custom metal. They built that body for us. That's the Muroc? Yes. Yes, yeah. And so they had built that body for us, they only charged us 12 grand to hand build that whole body. So I said to Boyd, I said, we just did that body for Frank, that was $12,000. I said, we're gonna have 10 grand in making this look straight. I said, let me draw another 32 and let's have Marcel's build it. And Boyd turns and grabs the phone, what's Marcel's number? I told him the number, he calls me, he says, can you build another 32 for us? He said, sure. Okay, thanks, hungs up, he says, 
design it. And that's where the Boyster came from. I had we'll built show a, you a picture of that in a moment. I had built the uh, a pedal car before I came to work for Boyd. I was building this pedal car at home, and I had made all those changes to the body that I wanted to make. Wedge cut it and raised the rear wheel wells, and and I, the approach was. What you would do with a 50 Merc to build a custom, I wanted to do the same thing to a 32 Ford Roadster. And that's where the Boyster came from. And then later was the Boyster too with the full fenders. Well, you couldn't have had a more talented person than Marcel Delay and oh, his son Luke. Phenomenal. I mean, they, uh, they could make anything out of aluminum, right? Yes, yep. I've been blessed to be able to work with, there, it was Marcel, his son Mark and Luke. Mark ended up leaving the company to fly airplanes. He, his dream his whole life was to be a pilot, but he was a phenomenal metal shaper, but he left to go fly planes. And Marcel and Luke, they sold the, the building that they were in, and Luke bought a farm in Corona, California that had a barn, and he put, he put his shop in the barn, and he and Marcel went in there, and that's where Luke is to this day. We unfortunately lost Marcel a few years back. Yeah, immensely talented. You look at the work that uh, Figoni and Falaschi did, Marcel could do that. You, uh, you look at some of the Italian coach builders that Ferrari used, same thing. Have you seen Luke's all aluminum car? I have, yeah. yeah. I was blessed to be able to work with him and pretty, pretty we created amazing. that together. So we've got a couple of more uh, <laughs> shots here with, with Boyd, uh, but it looks like Boyd is drawing something, which is why I asked the question. Or did, did he just grab your seat when you got up? It was his seat. <laughs> I just used it during the day. But yeah, he jumped in there and we were going over. That was a, a, a 29 Roadster that we were going to build. That, that's in 97, just before the bankruptcy. We were going to build an all aluminum 29 Roadster and call it the Silver Billet. After John Batera's uh, start with that? Uh, yes, John had his car that was a Silver Bullet. Mm hmm. So, and silver so we were going to build the silver billet because John was working with us at the same time. We were going to build the frame all out of aluminum, all the suspension, uh, the, the motor. We were going to build our own four cylinder motor in that all out of billet aluminum. And I was looking forward to doing that project. But unfortunately, the uh, rug was drug out from under our feet. But you did an aluminum, an all aluminum car, I think, a he, little coupe, right? Boyd did the Aluma truck mm -hmm. and he did a tub, Aluma tub. Right. And he did those after the bankruptcy and he started his own business. I had gone on and started my own business. Are we looking at Ken Reister's uh, car in this other picture here? Uh, no, that is actually, it was Buzz DeVosta's car that we called the Roadstar. Oh, right. Okay. That had the Cadillac North Star motor in the back. Mm -hmm. It was finished in 94 and competed for America's Most Beautiful Roadster. But unfortunately, Joe McPherson's 29 the, uh, won that year. The Infinity uh, yes. powered car, the yellow yes. car. So, but it looks as though you're doing a clay model and building the, uh, the car. Uh, that was a clay model that I did before we started the body. Mm -hmm. And that was obviously set up for a, uh, a photo shoot, but I was measuring something, looks like over on the other door where I was gonna put the A pillar or something. So not many hot rodders work with clay. No. Uh, they don't know how, it's not their thing, but, but obviously you would use it to perfect an idea and then I, I still it use clay to this day. Do you? I'm old school, I don't use a computer at all. Yeah. No, I don't even email. <laughs> 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 That's another story I'll tell you. When we set up email in our shop, they put a computer in my office and for the first week I was going in there and I was answering emails. And at the end of the first week, I came in and I, I answered all these emails and, and you know, you, you answer an email and you gotta look something up and then you get sidetracked and you go down one way and I got all finished and I looked down and I'm like, that was four hours. So I got done, I reached down, I unplugged the computer, I carried everything into the office and Lynn Stout, my office manager, I, I put it there and I said, give this to everybody wants it, but put my email address on your computer and I want you to answer all my emails, just come ask me if it's something you don't know. There's a life lesson here. Everybody. I'll be in the shop. So to this day, that's what we do. That's, fa that's, that's fabulous. So we talked about uh, uh, Boydster, and I'm not sure this is the right one, but... Uh, well, that's, that's a copy of the Boydster that uh, when, when Boyd went on and did his next business, he took all of the tooling that we had done and built another car with Marcel's and then sent that to, I think, Australia, where they were building the fiberglass kit you know, the kit car, but that's one of his kit cars that he built 
at his new shop. The basic shape, I think, uh, owes something was, to that. That was my design, yes. I mean, the, the idea that a 32 Ford, and we'll talk about that when we show your coupe, um, is a timeless design, but this was a way to stretch it, tweak it, yeah. uh, update it, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so overhaul, um, very successful show, went away, came back, um, built over 70 cars, I think. We, we did 170 cars. 170 cars. So think about that for a moment. Uh, 170, none of them alike, well, uh, and built ostensibly in a week. Uh, <laughs> the and first five years, we did the cars in eight days or less. And, really, and I think you, you had 60 plus people? I would have 60 to 70 people on that car. And, and uh, Carson Lev, who was my agent at the time, said, that's like taking nine women and having a baby in a month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they, they really were built in I would I would do the eight days with zero sleep. Well, Sometimes I'd take a nap while the car was in the booth. Yeah. But fear of failure will keep you working. Right. And and I have ADHD, so I could hyper focus on something. But it, it was interesting. I could, I could be in the seventh or eighth day, and I'm I'm, I'm a walking zombie, but I can focus and work on this project. Somebody from the shop could come up and ask me a question about something else, and I literally would fall asleep standing up and and wake up falling over. I'd, I'd say, look, I can't help you right now. Mm -hmm. Just treat this project as if it's your own and do what you believe you would do to it. And I'll come see you after I'm done with this build. Because we'd go the eight days, I'd finish a build. And the worst part about it was I would do the drawing of the car and then the production company would go make copies of all these drawings. And they would give it out to everybody that was on the build. And, and so we just gave the car away and all I want to do is sleep. My ankles hurt, my knees hurt. My hands hurt from holding tools. And then there'd be a line that would form of, with about 40, 50 people, and I'm gonna sign autographs for everybody. <laughs> but I would do it, and then I would crash. And I could only sleep and get back to the shop the next day and get ready to go do another overhaul. And we'd have two or three days between each build. They lasted eight days. We did 87 cars in five years. 87 cars in five years. And I was actually really happy when, uh, when we stopped after the first. <laughs> well, when you think about it, it's, it's really incredible. Most builders can take six months, a year, or longer. You start something you think is going to work, and it doesn't work. You didn't have the luxury of doing that. No, we were just trying to, to I mean, it was, like I say, fear of failure. But we did 87 cars in the first five years of overhauling. Then we went on hiatus. They said it was hiatus because they weren't canceling the show. They just said, we don't have the budget right now because it was uh, 2007 when the economy really tanked and we lost our advertisers. The car companies and the banking industry were our biggest advertisers for overhauling and they went away. So three and a half years later, they called me and said, we're ready to start up again. You want to go? And I said, look, I'm getting older. I would love to do it, but not in eight days. I said, give me two to three weeks per car and I'll do it. And that's what we did. And we went for another, I think it was three and a half years. We stopped again and then started again. For a total, we went for uh, 18 years of doing overhauling. And it was an absolute honor to make people's dreams come true. It was, uh, you know, it, originally I was asked to be the co-host with Jesse James on Monster Garage. Jesse and I both worked at Boyd's and Jesse called me to a meeting. He says, bring your portfolio. Uh, I, wanna, I want you to be my co-host, but we're gonna do this show called Monster Garage. And I go to this meeting and they, you know, the executives are there. I showed them my portfolio and then they tell me that, okay, we're doing this show. It's gonna be Monster Garage. The first car we're gonna do is a Ford Mustang. We're gonna turn it into a lawnmower that picks up golf balls. And if we don't get it done, we're going to burn it or blow it up. And then they said, the second episode, we're going to take a Ford Explorer and we're going to turn it into a trash truck. We're going to cut the top off. We're going to make an arm that picks up a trash can and dumps it inside the truck. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm at Foose Design trying to build the most beautiful pieces of rolling art that I can build. <laughs> and you're going to put me on television building these monsters that because it's on television, it's going to overshadow everything I do in my life. Mm -hmm. 
And as I said, I, I, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not interested in doing the show. And it's the best no I've ever given in business. Because a couple weeks later, Discovery Channel sent Bud Brussman, who's an amazing producer. He came into my shop and he says, Discovery Channel wants to do a show based on you. And, you know, we did rides before we ever did overhauling. Right, right. And I said, well, what's the show? And he says, well, it's going to be similar to, if, if you remember, Jesse James did that motorcycle mania where they followed him building a bike and going to a show. He says, I'm going to follow you on your next build and we're going to go to your show. And I said, well, I'm working on this 34 coupe that I'm trying to finish in 11 months from now to go compete for the Riddler Award. I said, you don't want to shoot for 11 months. I said, let me call Ford Motor Company and uh, let's see if they'll give us a SEMA vehicle and we'll build that and go to SEMA. And Bud says, what's SEMA? I said, trust me, that's the show you want to go to because every single type of vehicle is there. So I, I set him up with SEMA, told him who to call, and I called Jay Mays at Ford Motor Company. He says, you know, I, I said, we're going to do this show. I'm going to build a car. I'd like to build something that I can take to SEMA and possibly put it in your booth if it's good enough. He says, well, we're about to launch the new Thunderbird. So this was in 2000, 2002. He said, let me send you a new Thunderbird. For Speedbird. Yes. So, Would you tell us about, about that? I do think we have a picture of it, but since you're on it, let's talk about it. Well, I was supposed to get the car in May. I didn't get the car until September 12th. I had less than seven weeks to build that car. And what I started doing then is I went to work the day that we got it, and I would work 40 hours straight, and then I'd sleep for eight. Then I'd work 40 hours, and I'd sleep for eight. I did that for six weeks, and I did the last six days without sleep. We got it done. We got it to the show. I lost 27 pounds building that car. Mm. But Ford Motor Company gave it the best of show, their award. And uh, we finished that episode. And what we did is at SEMA, we went around and, and looked at all these other cars, found the owners and said, would you bring your car to the Las Vegas Motor Speedway on Saturday? And we brought all these cars from the SEMA show and we drove around the Las Vegas Motor Speedway. And that was the end of the filming. And uh, Bud put that show all together, sent it into Discovery Channel. He comes back and says, they love it. They want a series. So what are we doing next? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I about killed myself doing that. But what I did is I wrote down 25 different shop names and the owners and their phone numbers. And I said to Bud, I said, call all these owners of shops. Find out when they're starting their next build. And you can go once a month to their, to their shop, film where they're at, and in 10 months, you could have 27 episodes. It's a brilliant idea. I didn't realize that I should have owned it. Yep. <laughs> I gave it to him. But that's where rides came from, and we did 59 episodes. I was lucky enough to be involved with uh, 15 of those, and we did some really fun stuff. But I said to Bud, I said, I would still like to do a series, but let's do something. Now, Monster Garage was, was airing. I said, let's do something similar to Monster Garage, where we build a car in a week, but rather than building a monster, let's go find cars that are in people's garages or side yards that they don't have the money or the means to create their dream car, and let's build it and give it to them as a gift. And Bud had the idea of pranking them and maybe stealing the car. He wrote up a treatment, and Discovery Channel ordered seven episodes right off the bat, and that's where it just went crazy. So a quick aside about SEMA. Specialty Equipment Marketers Association used to be the Speed Equipment Marketers Association. Um, I, I've gone in every year. I uh, love to see the new cars and so forth. Many times, manufacturers will have an absolutely outrageous-looking lady in a very scanty outfit with the highest heels you've ever seen signing autographs. Now, uh, Chip mentioned signing autographs no matter how, how tired he was. And... Uh, at one particular SEMA show, I saw a line that snaked through what seemed like half the building. I don't normally look for this kind of thing, but I thought, this has got to be some extraordinary babe. I guess I'll just try to go around to the front of the line and see who it is. And I, I had to beat my way past a couple of people. I said, wait a minute, we're in line here. I said, no, no I just want to see who's signing. Yeah, we all just want to. It was Chip. <laughs> He was very disappointed it wasn't a babe. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So we'll, uh, we'll let's talk about some of the cars. This was uh, uh, done for Wes Rydell, uh, and this is not a car that if you saw the stock version, you would say, oh my God, I've got to have one. But you, man you guys managed to transform this into absolutely a thing of, thing of beauty. Well, thank you. And you know, it's interesting, we built this car for Wes Rydell. And you know, most people know me for the cars of overhaul, and, and that's something that we would put together in eight days or less. Well, these are the cars that I really, truly, you know, this, this is what tugs at my heartstring, is building something like this, or a car completely from scratch, designing it and building it from ground up. We spent six years on this car, and it is a 1935 uh, Master Sedan, and it doesn't look anything like a 1935 Master Sedan. We cut it up, and we probably used about 20% of the original sheet metal. The rest of it is all completely hand formed and put together. But when we're building a car to compete for a Riddler type award, you know, as I said earlier, they look for the worst two inch section of that car. So we try to make every single piece as if it will be the focal point of the car and finish it to that level. And if you do every single piece to that level, then when you put it together, you, you're hoping that you have no problems with it. I could tell you every single problem that I had with this car when we got to Detroit. And number one was we had the car in the, in the shop and when we were getting ready to pull it off the jack stands and put it into the trailer to take it, I was underneath it and I discovered a chip in the transmission pan. And I thought, we don't even have enough time because there's candy gold that was painted underneath the motor and transmission, everything is hand rubbed and polished and, and finished. And I'm thinking, we're running late already, we gotta get to Detroit from California. And I discovered this little chip. So I grabbed Carl, who was my machinist, and I said, right next to that chip is the drain plug for the motor, the, the, you know, in the back. The and I said, yep. I said, make another one identical, but put a curve on it, I did a sketch and we super glued it to the oil, to the oil pan. <laughs> so it just looked like you had two drain plugs there. So that was one of the problems. The other one was when we slid the, the steering column through the firewall, it went a little bit too far and there was a chip on the top of the steering column. Well, I spent the time to get up in there and, and, and brush touch it, but then color sand it and rub it, but it was a metallic color. So if you could look at the top of it, you would see that it wasn't perfectly aligned metallics, but you could never feel it because it sanded it and polished it. That was number two. Uh, number three was on the rear window. The window had a little tiny scratch, but if I used a Q-tip with WD-40 on it and wiped it, you could never see it. Those were the three problems that I had with that car when we took it. Everything else was as perfect as we could make it, and we were fortunate enough to win. Well, and you can win this award and fool the judges, as you just <laughs> did. Uh, Dan, Webb, Dan Webb, who won it one year in a Roadster, I marveled that every bolt and not everything was clocked, meaning yes. every single one was perfect. And afterward, I, I said to him, how'd you do that? I mean, how did you do it? He said, some of them are tight and some of them are loose. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. How, how about uh, Ron Whiteside's? Uh, Ron Whiteside's 34, another, another one. We, Mercury uh, did not make a car in 1934. So. I'll, I'll tell you why we called it the Mercury. I was working on this car. We started this car at Boyd's, and uh, it's, it's the only customer that when Boyd's collapsed in 98, Ron Whiteside said, I would like you to finish this car. So I took that home and started working on it in my garage. And then when we started the shop, we had it in the shop, and you know, I allow people to come through the shop and take pictures and, and uh, you know, every day we give tours. Well, I ended up making a friend who had come through my shop and his name was uh, Morris Cahill. He lived in Winnipeg, Canada. And Morris calls me one day when we're getting this car finished to go to Detroit. He calls me, he says, hey, he says, I'm building a copy of that 34 that you're building to go to Detroit this year to compete for, for Riddler. And I said, well, I'm taking this one this year. So we're gonna go head to head. He says, well, I wonder if, if you'll design the wheels for it. And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're, you're trying to beat me with the, you're copying the car that we're building. So I knew he was coming from Canada. And uh, I thought, well, we're coming from America. Well, when America sends a Ford to Canada, 
they remake it as a Mercury. So I thought, okay, well, we have a Ford coming from Canada, so I'm gonna bring a Mercury from, from America. So I, I ended up making it the Mercury, we called it the, uh, the Stallion, instead of, you know, Ford is known for a, a Mustang. So I thought, well, what would Mercury make? They made a Stallion, just made it up, and, and we went and we were lucky again, and we, and we won the Riddler with this car. It's a stunning car. Thank you. Really. And here's uh, Ken Reister's uh, impression, which was, yes. uh, by the way, Riddler uh, was Don Riddler. I'm sorry it's spelled with one D, not two, but he was a major player at the Detroit Autorama, and that's well, where he started the, the show. came from, yep. So it's in honor of, of Don Riddler that they have the Riddler Award. And so Go here's ahead. a 36 Ford that, again, <laughs> doesn't have anything on it from a 36, but you can... The VIN a number. real car. Well, the VIN <laughs> number. Fair enough. But again, uh, talk about stylized design. The 36 Ford is a very pretty car, well, but this is stunning. It's way beyond you. anything Bob Gregory could have imagined. You remember Larry Erickson's Smooster that he designed, and we finished at Boyd's. Mm -hmm. While we were finishing it, that was Larry's design. I kept thinking... I could build this from that. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to meet Ken Reister, and he says, I'd like to build something that looks similar to the Smooster. And I, we were at Fishbones in Detroit. We were at the Riddler show, and we went over to Fishbones to talk, and I took one of their napkins, and I did this sketch of this car. And he says, let's build it. So this is one that was completely from ground up, another clay model that I built, a uh, quarter-scale clay model, and then blew it up to you know, hand build all of the panels with Marcel's. And it's interesting, on this car, I never, one of, one of the themes throughout the car was, I didn't want to see any part stacked on top of another part. So everything that bolts to that car is puzzle pieced. So if something was gonna bolt to the frame, we took a piece of half inch plate and we machined it down a quarter of an inch. We welded bungs in the bottom and then the top piece would be start with a quarter inch plate and that would, slide into it and puzzle piece into the frame and then the bolts went in. And so that entire car, nothing is stacked on one another and I wanted every parting line to be like a door gap where they're flush. So even the fenders, the running boards, everything as it bolted to the body was treated like a door cut. And we spent six years building it and- Six, six years and yeah. God knows how many hours. So, uh, <laughs> but it's- It was about, 33,000 hours in that car. So think about an hourly rate. Think about <laughs> 33. Do the math. <laughs> and when you're running a shop and you're losing about $150 an hour, that's a lot of money I lost. <laughs> so the interesting thing about the Riddler, unlike Amber, where it's roadsters up to 1937, you can bring anything to the yes. Riddler Award. And here's a good example. Uh, and this was done for Don and Elma Voth. Yes, yep. this is a 1965 Impala. I shortened it 14 inches. And Don came in and he says, Elma and I drove a 65 Impala on our honeymoon. I'd like to build a 65 Impala and give it to Elma. So this was gonna be her driver. And I said, well, the first thing with a hot rod that you're gonna give to a woman is don't give her something that can fail. So I said, why don't we take a brand new Corvette We'll pull the body off. We're not going to cut any wires in all the electrical system. And let's, let's stretch the frame from the Corvette and we'll shorten the body because I, I thought the Impala was a little bit long. I said, we'll, short, we'll shorten the body and we'll put that together. She can drive it. And if she has a problem, she can pull into a Chevy dealership, plug it into the computer. They'll know what part to put in it. It'll be foolproof and she can just enjoy it. Great. So that was the intentions for the car. So halfway through, when we get the body mounted and, and we're putting everything together, Don says, why don't we build this for the Riddler? Go compete. And I said, well, do you want to just go to the Riddler or do you want to win the Riddler? He says, no, I want to win the Riddler. I said, let's do something else because this is an all stock car underneath it. That's ridiculous. If I'm going to build a car for the Riddler, I want to design and build everything underneath it. He says, no, I think we should take it. I purposely was stalling because I did not want to take this car to the Riddler. There is more work in the bottom of that car than any car I ever did because think about it, going and buying a brand new production car and then trying to compete for the Riddler with it. Every single piece of the bottom of that car, the frame, every A-arm, every single piece had to be reworked. 
But we did it, and again, we were lucky enough to win. Pretty astounding. So here's Hemisphere, which um, Chip is sitting next to right now, and the story kind of begins with the model uh, behind. Uh, well, we have it on the on the up up there. So this was uh, the initiation was your senior project at this, Art Center, I think. Yes, this was my senior project at Art Center. It was a Chrysler sponsored project, and when Chrysler came in, they gave us the project, and the example they give is they wanted us to create a niche market vehicle. And the example was a guy that likes to work out on an exercise bike, he could charge a battery, put that battery in his car and get to and from work that day. And I'm thinking, well, that's something that I'll probably never do in my lifetime. <laughs> but I, I did about five proposals based on that information, little lightweight vehicles and, and whatever we could do to create a niche market vehicle. But I did a second proposal without talking to any of the other students in the class or my instructors. Because as I said before, drawing hot rods or muscle cars was taboo and you would get lectured for it. Well, I drew, because it was for Chrysler, I did modern Cudas, Challengers, and I took the plan view of a 33 Plymouth and the side view of a 70 Cuda. And I drew one car and I put this whole presentation together with, with the, I probably had five or six different drawings and Tom Gale, who was the president of Chrysler at the time, that's who we were presenting to. So I put both proposals up, and everybody's kind of looking at it like, why is he doing this? And when it was my turn to present, Tom Gale came over and he says, okay, I know what you're doing here, but what are you doing here? And I said, well, you asked us to create a niche market vehicle. And just like every other project in this room, Everybody created a niche market vehicle, but we're also trying to create a customer. And I said, what I'm doing over here is I'm catering to customers that exist. I said, there are thousands of people out there with muscle cars or their older hot rod bodies trying to put modern trans you know, technology into them so they can enjoy them on a daily basis. I said, let's build something for that person that exists to go ahead and enjoy. I said, and we can tug on some heartstrings you know, I'm, I'm looking at Cudas and Challengers. I said, we'll tug on heartstrings of memories where that's how you're going to get a customer. And uh, I said, it's not today's designer's fault that a designer in the past chose to go away from a great form. You know, you look at a 70 Cuda or 71 Cuda, and then, or, or even if you look at a Mustang, you know, there, it's one body style and then it gets cut off and they do something completely new. I said, we have the opportunity to go back to what we had in the past and evolve it into something new. And Tom Gale says, well, what do you want to build? I said, well, what I'd really love to build would be one of these, but I know you're going to want me to build one of those. He says, no, I want you to build the hot rod. And the minute he said that, I was all smiles. And this is the model that I had to build for Art Center. The, the fenders are missing, but I knew I wanted to finish a model at Art Center. Typically, you would do a clay model, you would paint the model, you would make some wheels that would go on it, and that model within a month would be all cracked and, and basically destroyed. So I knew I wanted to build a fiberglass body and build something that I could keep for the rest of my life. So Trans 8, that class, we had two instructors, one on Mondays and one on Fridays. So Monday was a class that I brought my drawings in and the instructor signed off on, on the drawings to start my clay model. I had my clay model finished on Friday and the instructor signed off on my clay model. So then over the weekend, I took my clay model, it was a simple form, and I just, normally you would make uh, you know, some walls that you would build half of a mold on and then the other half. I didn't do that. I just put plaster of Paris over the whole thing with some hemp and I plastered the whole clay model. And when that dried, I ran it through the bandsaw and I pulled it apart, pulled the clay out, cleaned up the two sides of the molds, put it back together and plastered it back together, cleaned up the inside and I made my, I made my fiberglass mold. The mold was the finished product. You well, well, I just yeah. I put it together, I made, I made the mold, and then I made the fiberglass body. So the instructor that signed off on my drawings to do a clay model on Monday, the following Monday I had my fiberglass body there. And he came in and he says, 
well, I can't help you with the design. <laughs> I said, but I want to build aluminum wheels and aluminum suspension, and that was this model. It was the first time at Art Center that somebody had done a fiberglass body and finished it in the, in the same term. But uh, it, it was a, a fun model to build. I had built the fenders, and unfortunately the fenders, Chrysler wanted me to send that model to Detroit. So I sent it back there, and when they sent it back, they didn't put the fenders in separate box, and they got destroyed when it came back, so. So tell us how that got to the Prowler. Well, to say that I designed the Prowler is a slap in the face to all the engineers and, and designers that actually did that production car. But this was definitely the inspiration, and it was a huge door opener for me when I graduated. Um, Tom Gale became a great friend, and we built another car uh, I did with Troy Trepanier, the Sniper. Mm. Well, I had done the drawings, and, I, and I, uh, I was in Detroit, and I took the drawings over, and I showed them to Tom Gale, and I said, I want to know what the possibilities are, are of getting a V12 Viper motor that we can put in this. In a 53 Ford Plymouth. 53 Savoy, right. <laughs> or a Belvedere, actually. Right. But uh, I, I said, well, we're hoping to put a V12 in this. And he said, I'll do you one better. I have an engineering car, which is, they hadn't released the coupes yet. He says, I have an engineering car that's, that's in, in the department. I'm going to send you a coupe. So we sent the coupe to Troy, and that's what we built the sniper out of. The whole undercarriage of this 53 Belvedere is a Viper Coupe. Phenomenal car, really fun. So we're talking V12 engines. Here's a 32 Ford with a Lincoln V12. <laughs> um, fascinating concept behind this car, if you'd tell everyone. What's interesting that you have the two together because this is pretty much you know where hot rodding has gone. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do, when we built the impression you know, typically when you're at a show, people are saying, well, how are you going to top that? You know, and that's, that's a tough question to answer. And I didn't want to top it. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to go have fun because we were so painstakingly finishing that car. We spent six years on it. So when I got back to the shop, I just wanted to do something fun and let the guys express themselves. So I drew up this car. And the whole theme behind this is going back to the roots of hot rodding which basically exploded right after World War II because all these guys were in the military. They were learning how to make motors you know, perform and how to make things work better than they did before. And hot rodding and dry lakes were, were you know, the racing industry was, was growing. So I thought, let's go back to the roots of hot rodding. But what if that hot rodder was a World War II fighter pilot and he missed his P-40 Warbird and themed his roaster around that? So... From the Cal Ford, I clay modeled all of the nose, and then we pulled molds and, and built that. I used the 32 grill shell, you know, built that spinner and, and, and did it, like I say, all out of clay. But then Marcel's, they hand built all the aluminum. I did all the work on the, on the rest of the body, but, uh, you know, it is a Lincoln Zephyr V12, and there's no room for a tie rod up front. So I ended up building a model, and I used a 53 Corvette steering box and the steering arm goes back to a drag link and there's one on each side back on the side of the transmissions so the tie rod between the two is underneath the transmission totally and then under the, the two car. arms so it's a push and pull steering hmm. and and it works and it's a lot of fun it's a great looking but car. Uh, like i say I, I didn't want to do something that was painstakingly hard and and all about detail mm -hmm. it's just a theme and it was a blast to build and a blast to drive so here's a five window that I guess took you a number of years to pry out of someone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Kevin Bell, who uh, is actually a machinist, he's got an aerospace machine shop. He was doing all of John Butera's machine work, and that's who I met him through. I met him while Boyd's was still in, in, you know, in business, and uh, I asked him if he wanted to sell this car. It was in his shop. He hauled it from Michigan out to Irvine. He had his shop or his machine shop out there. It was in the back corner, and it was completely stock. Had one paint job over the original paint job. It was a four-cylinder, and I asked him if he wanted to sell it. He says, no, it's not for sale. I'm going to build this one day. So for 12 years, I kept bugging him. You want to sell it? You want to sell it? No, I'm going to build it one day. And he called me on a, I think it was a Wednesday, and he says, you still want that coupe? I said, well, yeah, I've always wanted it. He says, I need this much money and I need it by Friday. I've got another person that wants it. If you don't take it, it's gone. 
And I said, well, let me come down there. So I go down there and I'm thinking, you know, it's the last thing I need right now, but I really wanted it. And I said, you know, I'm gonna have to let this one go. And he says, you don't want it? I said, no, I, I really, I, I don't need the project right now. He says, well, you know all the speed equipment and the, all the suspension and the brakes go with it. What speed equipment? <laughs> he takes me in this other room and he's got all the brakes, he's got a front axle, he's got a rear axle, and he's got some other pieces. And I said, you're just twisting my arm. I said, I'll take it. I didn't end up using any of the parts that he had, <laughs> but I didn't want to change it that much. I, I did some taillight treatment on it and uh, I wanted it to be restored in the interior because it was so nice, I didn't want to destroy that stock car. So I just hot-rodded the chassis, I made the wheels, I wanted the wheels to match the interior, and I wanted them to look like a Dow Chemical magnesium wheel, the, the Dow gold, 7. gold finish, yep. And uh, the wheels are a takeoff of an old Halibrand that was a, a six-lug wheel, and I, I just changed it to a five-lug and changed the design a little bit, but... Uh, Still has the kidney bean... Uh, Sheep, yes. So, and, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're stunning, and, those wheels. And I wanted them to look like a pin drive wheel that has a real knockoff, but those are actually the uh, Euro lugs, small lugs that are in there. And uh, yeah, it's an honor to have this car. Another beautiful car. Thank you. Uh, interesting story behind this because uh, <laughs> you didn't plan to uh, no. have it at all, but I think there's somebody in the room who knows a lot about it. <laughs> well, a friend of mine in Athens, Georgia, Tom Hardy, has Clarksboro Hot Rods. And he had invited me back to his open house. And I had just started dating Kathleen, who's sitting up here. And we went back to his open house. And Jim Fallon, who's one of his friends, had this car at his open house. And he asked Kathleen, he says, well, what do you think of these hot rods? She says, well, I've never been in one. <laughs> and he looked at me, he says, you've never given her a ride in a hot rod? I said, no, I haven't, actually. And he says, well, take her for a ride. And I said, oh, no, I don't like to drive other people's cars. He said, no, I insist, take her for a ride. So we get in the car and, and we go for a ride and the car drives amazing. This car was built in 1956 by a hot rodder out in California and it was finished without fenders. In 1971, the owner put the fenders back on it and repainted it this black lacquer. And so I, we go for a ride in it and Kathleen takes a selfie of, of herself and this, Which and we, we have somewhere to show you in a moment. But. <laughs> so we, we come back in and uh, Jim asked her, well, what'd you think? She says, I absolutely love it. That's so much fun. And, and I, I looked at him and I said, you know, that's first ride in a hot rod. I said, you know what that means, don't you? He says, what's that? I said, you got to sell me your car. <laughs> <laughs> he says, well, we can do that. He gave me a price and I, and I bought it. So that's our first ride in a hot rod. There, there it is, that's her selfie. And that's Jim on the right when he, uh, you know, I came back and I told him, I said, you gotta sell it. That's, that's when we were making the deal right there. So there's another lesson here for those of you who <laughs> want a car. Uh, take the lady you love out uh, in a, for a ride, you never know. The only thing I've done to that car is I took the seat out and rebuilt all the, the frame in it so I could get it back. We pulled it back about four inches. Mm. So this um, 33 Ford wagon is lovely from an era where Ford had its own forest in Iron, Iron uh, Mountain, Michigan. They, uh, they had acres and acres of virgin timber and they built these beautiful wooden bodies. So you haven't changed this much at all. No, I, I really haven't done hardly anything to it. Uh, this is my same friend, uh, Tom Hardy. He sent me pictures of a 36 Woody that he wanted to buy and or he just sends it on my phone so i'm looking at him and this 33 is in the background and i said what about the 33 is that is that for sale and he says no that one's not for sale and then about uh four months later he sends me a picture of this and he says the guy wants to sell this 33 and, and i want to buy it what do you think and i said well that's the one that i wanted a few months ago and he says oh that's right he says well i was thinking about trying to buy this and i said well why don't you he says well i don't have all the money yet I said, well, you want a partner? He says, sure. So he gave me the price. I sent him half of the money. And I called him a week later. I said, did you get the Woody? He says, well, no, I don't have all the money. <laughs> I, I said, well, how much are you shy? And he says, well, well, I had given him the other half. He, he, was, he had 10 grand that he could put towards it. I said, well, I'll send you the rest. Just go get it. 
So I sent him the rest of the money. Then he calls me about, about two months later. He says, uh, hey, I got somebody that wants, wants to buy this Woody. I said, well, do you need your 10 grand out of it? He says, yeah. I said, I'll send you the money. So I ended up owning all of it. <laughs> That's, um, this could be one of the nicest 31034s I've ever seen. It's just, it's so understated and so subtle. And uh, for people who have looked at some of the cars tonight where every square inch is modified, is it difficult for you to take something like this and just... No, you know, people know me for overhauling and the Riddler and Amber cars, but I love original cars also. But I like them subtly modified, things that you can bolt on and take it off and bolt it back to being all original if you wanted. And this car is something that, it's got the big and little tires and a dropped axle in it and some speed equipment on the flathead. But the first time I saw this, and I have to give credit to uh, Tom Hardy again because I found this car through Tom. He's the one that had done some work on this for uh, Dick Bridges who lives in South Carolina. And uh, he sent me some pictures of this car and he said that Dick had sold it, but he just wanted to show me the car. I said, wow, that's beautiful. And he called me two or three days later. He said, the guy ended up uh, dropping out of that sale. That car's available. And I said, well, how much is it? And he gives me a price and I thought, I could sell my Indian four. I have a 1931 Indian four at home. So I came home and I told Kathleen, I said, I'm gonna sell the Indian four and uh, she says, why are you selling that? And I said, I'm going to buy this 34 coupe. Now, 34 three-window coupe was my father's favorite car. And he never had one. And I, th I wanted to get one for him. But unfortunately, he passed away, and I didn't get it before he passed away. But I always wanted one. I got a beauty. You know, and uh, so I told Kathleen, we're going to sell the 31 Indian, and I'm going to go buy this coupe. She says, I don't want you to sell the Indian. I'll buy the coupe. So this is actually Kathleen's car. I, I can't take credit for ownership, but here, stand up. <laughs> it's on loan from Kathleen this week for the next few months. So I think Bruce is giving me the, uh, we're almost ready for question time. So let me just flick through these really quickly. Um, this uh, 48 That's, Ford is, uh, if we do a sentence or two on each car, Chip, and then we'll jump to Yeah, my father, when he graduated high school in 1953, this was his dream car. He couldn't afford to build it. He collected parts through the years, and in 1975, this is the first car I ever did any metal work on, and I worked with my father to build this car, and, and I own it today. It's really beautiful. I, I had a 48 Ford in high school. It, it didn't hold a candle to that, I can tell you. <laughs> this car, I, I wasn't looking for it, but I had, Kathleen and I were up in Monterey at Bonham's auction, and this 1943 Willys Jeep came up, and we're sitting there, and, and I, I hear uh, going once, going twice, and it was at 19,000. And I'm thinking, that's really cheap. So I raised my hand. I didn't even have a bidder's pass but I bought this 1943 Willys Jeep and uh, we had it back at the shop and I was at one of my customers uh, museums that he's got a, a small collection and this car was in his collection and it's absolutely beautiful. Top, bottom, engine compartment, everything is finished to the same level that the outside is. And uh, he says, yeah, I'm gonna take this to the auction, I'm gonna sell it. Well, the next week he was at my shop and he walked in and he sees this army Jeep and he and his wife both walk in and she just flips out over it. And she says, I want this. And he says, what do you want for it? And I said, I'll take that 56 that you got back home. So I traded my Jeep and, <laughs> and Kathleen won't let me forget that I traded away her Jeep because I told her it was for her. She's got a roadster. <laughs> so everybody wants a 56 Ford big window uh, custom pickup truck. And you, this, is, this has a little special story behind it too, I think. Well, this was my very first car that I ever owned. In fact, I wrecked this car when I was 12 years old, when my father was teaching me how to drive. And I didn't just hit a normal car, I hit a Rolls Royce uh, head on. Problem was the Rolls was parked. <laughs> so I was parking the truck and uh, my, I was using my body weight to turn to park next to the Rolls and my foot slipped off the brake. I hit the throttle pedal, lit up the rear tires and hit that Rolls. But I bought this car from my father in 1978. It's the first car I ever owned. And I had done the drawings of what I wanted to do to this car. 
and Bud Brutzman, the, the producer from Overhaul, he stole my drawings and he hired my father to run our team and build this truck for me. And they surprised me at the uh, 2007 SEMA show with it. And uh, not only did I get my first truck back, which I was devastated when it disappeared, but that is a piece of my father's artwork also fabulous. that I own. Just fabulous. So we've got just a couple more. This deceptive looking C10 has a secret under the hood. Well, I had found, actually a friend of mine wanted, I had a Z20 or a Z06 Corvette motor. He was looking for one and I said, yeah, I've got one. So I sold it to him and I delivered it. He says, you want this old small block that came out of the car? I said, what is it? He says, small block, I don't want it. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I'll take it. So we loaded it in the back of my truck. I go back to the shop and I run the numbers to see what it is. And it turns out to be a real 1967 Z28 Camaro motor, which they only built 636 of those blocks. It's a very rare motor. So I call him up right away and I said, this is a 67 Z28 motor. I said, this is a valuable motor. You, you, you want this back? He says, no, I don't want it. You can have it. So I thought, well, cool. And, and they didn't keep the, the VIN numbers or keep track of them in 67. So if you have a 67 Camaro, you could put that motor in it and the, the pieces that it needs, and you will have a real 67 Z28. And I thought about doing that, and I thought, well, what if GM were building sport trucks then? And that, you know, their trucks were called C10s, this, this model. And I thought, I want to put the Z28 motor in it and call it a C28. And so even the, in the glove box, when you open the glove box, there's a paper uh, sticker in there with all the options of the truck, everything that's done to it. Well, we photographed that and I reprinted it and I put all these C28 options in there. So everything that's done to the truck is as if it were all done at the factory. I made the Camaro bumpers to fit it. I did the Camaro, uh, the houndstooth interior. Of course, that houndstooth didn't come out till 69, but it's my favorite orange and black material. That truck was originally white and the interior was that hugger orange color. And originally what I was going to do was put this truck all together with patina, run the rally wheels on it, and make it look like this was an original sport truck built by General Definitely. Motors. And then I, I had this deal with uh, 3M, and they wanted me to restore a car. And I thought, well, let me do the truck. So we did the truck, and there was eight episodes on the restoration of it, but I ended up creating the C28. I sold it. As soon as I finished it, one of my customers wanted it. I sold it to him. He sold it to a friend of his, and then we borrowed it. And when I borrowed it for the SEMA show just a couple years back, the owner says, if you know anybody that wants it, I'm, I'm interested in selling it. I said, well, what do you want for it? And he gave me a price, and I said, well, unfortunately, I don't have that money, but I'll, I'll trade you something. He says, what do you have? I said, what do you want? <laughs> he says, I've always wanted a 70 Chevelle, so I built a 70 Chevelle. I had, I had, draw I had one, and I had done drawings of what I wanted to do to it. So I built that car and traded back. So I've, I've got it back now. I think you got the better part of the deal. <laughs> truck is well, stunning. You saw the Grand Master earlier, and that was, we built that for Wes Rydell. Wes Rydell is a, a General Motors or Chevrolet dealer. He's got 100 dealerships. And on the t back tailgate of this, there is a, the original pot metal logos that dealers used to order that screwed into the body. I found an original Rydell Chevrolet badge, and that's on the tailgate because Wes has been so good to me. I wanted to promote something that you could have gotten from GM back then. Devil's in the details, right? I think we've got two more. Um, I'm not sure what this Ferrari is doing out there, <laughs> but, but Phil Hill used to say that the uh, 330 GTC was the best driving Ferrari of its era. It's a lot of fun to drive this car. I've driven it around the block twice. <laughs> uh, actually, actually that, that car, I wasn't looking for that one either, but one of my customers I was building a car for, he had the car in Japan, he flew it back over here, and he, was, he took it to an auction in Santa, Santa Monica. It didn't reach res reserve, so he wasn't selling, now he, he, it was just sitting in California in a warehouse. He was going to bring it back to either take it back to Japan or try to sell it at, at another auction. But he's in the shop, and he fell in love with two cars that I had. And he asked me, he says, would you sell these? And as a joke, I said, well, I said, yeah, I'd sell them. And he says, 
well, what do you want for him? And as a joke, I said, I'll trade you for your Ferrari. And he looked at me and he says, serious? And I said, if you're serious. He says, okay. <laughs> so that's how I got it. I traded two of my cars for, for this car. I thought it'd be a great investment. And uh, I, I do have plans to alter it, but only things that I can bolt on and off of it. What I'd like to do is duplicate that wheel in an 18 inch and put those wheels on the car and drop it down just a little bit and that's all I want to do to it. Other than some of this car is still the original paint. It only has 38,000 kilometers on it, which is like 17,000 miles. And uh, it would be a shame to modify it. I may paint the whole thing one day, but for right now, I just want to put wheels on it and I give it a better stance. I think you'll be really impressed when you drive it. it it's phenomenal, yeah. Um, last car, and then we'll get into <laughs> to questions. Uh, uh, there's Porsche badges on this uh, Myers Manx, so there's got to be a story here. Well, Philip Serafin, who bought Myers Manx from Bruce Meyer, mm -hmm. who recently passed away, he bought it and he hired another friend of mine, Freeman Thomas, who's the chief designer at Myers Manx now. They're actually building new Myers Manx. This is one of their uh, remastered bodies. And I'm building two of them, one for Kathleen. This one I built for myself, but I just wanted to do something that was whimsical and fun. And I thought, you know, these were built to take a Volkswagen and use that as the donor vehicle and build these Myers Manx. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to use, instead of the Volkswagen, use a 356 Porsche as the donor vehicle. And if you know who Rod Emery is, he builds the Outlaw 356 Porsches. He's a good friend of mine. And I called him up and I said, I'm looking for some 356 parts and uh, wondering if you got anything that I might be able to use. He said, just come up. He has a complete building full of everything that he's taken off of all these 356s for years. So I walked through and I go, well, these gauges would be cool. And this steering column, this steering wheel, and you know, just let me collect all these pieces, the, the grab bar on the, on the front hood. And uh, then we put the 911 fan shroud and I did the 356 hubcaps. And uh, it, it's, it's just meant to be whimsical and fun. Rod Emery's grandfather was Neil Emery, yes. a partner with Clay Jensen for uh, Valley Custom. And his word was, um, his grandfather said to him, change things, but make it look as though nothing was changed. Right. Oh, very cool. And, and um, Bruce is eagerly waiting for questions. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we're, so, we're, so we're, I want to make sure you have time to get questions and answers. And so we have two microphones. So if you will, just raise your hand and please, um, uh, I guess, ask your question into the microphone because we are recording, so we want to make sure we get it. Thanks. So more of a comment, I guess, with, with overhaul, and I just wanted to say thanks for keeping it family friendly. It was great to be able to watch that show and, you know, little kids running around and not have to worry about them hearing something on the TV that, I, that they would repeat later. So the thing about overhauling was that, that it was a family friendly show. And the cool thing, I think, with you know, obviously the cars, but at the end of the show, it's the personal aspect to it that made overhauling so special. I mean, the reaction of the people that you were doing the cars for, that was fantastic, and I think that's what took a good show and made it a fantastic show. So well, thank you very much. The family for me. And thank party. you for noticing. You know, I, I would have a meeting. I would have a meeting at the beginning of, of each episode when we bring in guest builders, and I would say, look, I want you all to watch your language because my goal for this show is to have kids watch it because they're our future for this industry. I want kids to watch this show, and I want parents to want their kids to watch this show. I said, so thank you for noticing. Chip, I had the pleasure of meeting you in Rhode Island, you and your lovely wife, and you had mentioned that you will- A little louder, we can't hear you. Okay, I had the pleasure of meeting you in Rhode Island, you and your lovely wife. You had mentioned you may be leaving California and moving to either Georgia or Tennessee. Have you chosen a spot yet? No, but we're looking. Okay, good. <laughs> I hope it's Georgia. <laughs> thank you. Hey, Tape, um, I got a question. So what was your first car that you designed before you did your, um, before you started your company? The first car that I designed before I started my company? Uh, wow, that's, that's difficult to think of what the first car was. Uh, well, the, the 48 Maroon 
chop top that's out here is the first car that I ever did any metal work. I actually did the Frenching of the gravel pans to the body on that car. And, uh, you know, so, but the first car that I designed, I started drawing when I was three years old and my father was a tremendous artist. So when he would draw, I would sit next to him. And while he was drawing, I was copying what he was drawing. And when he would finish, he would leave his drawing on the table and I would draw it over and over and over again because my father was my hero, still is to this day, and I wanted to be as good as him. He's still the best that I've ever known, and uh, I'm still trying to make him proud. That's sweet. Um, uh, we, we can't hear what, you. What three cars would I never sell or trade? Mm. Uh, well, my 56 pickup, I would be torn to sell that because I'd like to give that to my son. And if it's not this one, it's going to be one very similar that I have at the shop now that I started to build for a customer that I was doing all the things that weren't done to this one. But because my father built this, I don't ever want to get rid of it. But I have another one that I'm that I'm... I just recently purchased from a customer that had to end the project. And uh, let's see, the second one, I, I would hate to sell this one because it means so much to me uh, and through my education. But in order to, if we move here, I'm thinking I may sell some cars to get into a building. But uh, the, the ones that I really wouldn't want to sell are the truck, my father's 48, the maroon one, and this one. You know, I, do, I know you've done a great job with overhauling, but what most people don't know, you have a fantastic YouTube channel as well. Well, thank you. And I'll, I'll watch it, and I'm a subscriber to your YouTube channel. So anything you can bring up new pops up, and I get to watch it. Thank you. So, well, I actually just pitched an idea to my producer who films our YouTube channel, and I told him that I would like to start calling the people that own the cars that we did on overhauling. And what I want to do is film, where are they now? The cars of overhauling. And if it's a new owner, I want to talk about why they bought it and get the old owner in and, and what that car meant to them after we gave it to them. So that's a new series that we're going to start to film for the YouTube channel. And there was a good one that you had with you and your son where y'all were working on a project there too. So I enjoyed well, thank that you. as well. Did you ever do a project and then step back and say, ooh? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, that it's, you know, as an artist, I can create what I think is the, the coolest illustration that I've ever done. And I'm so proud and so happy to have done it. And I'll put it on the wall and I'll go in the other room. And when I come back, I look at that and I see something that really bothers me about it. And that's all I see every time I look at it. And that's why I do not have any tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> well, while you're thinking for a moment, uh, just before we started, uh, Chip said we should talk about Disney and Pixar and cars. We didn't do that. So we could do a really quick hit about uh, what you're doing for, for Pixar. Well, I was very, less, or very blessed to get involved with uh, John Lasseter and his entire crew when I built the Speedbird and had it at the SEMA show. Mm -hmm. John was there with his crew doing research for the first Cars film. And when he saw my Speedbird, he asked me if I would build one of those for his wife. And we talked about it, that never happened. But he said, what other shows would be a great show for me to take the crew to for inspiration? And I said, well, you're in Emeryville, which is right near Oakland, California. I said, Pleasanton is the Street Rod Nationals. And it was happening in like two weeks from there. And I said, why don't you go to Pleasanton and take the crew there? I said, in fact, I'll be there. And if you are familiar with a stand-up comic, Christopher Titus, well, I had built a 56 Chevy handyman wagon for Christopher that was red and I did flames on it. And we took it up to the show. And when John saw that car, 
he turned to me, he says, I have a character in the movie called, his name is Ramon. It's a 59 Chevy and I want to put flames on it. I want it purple with flames. And he says, I love your flame pattern here. Would you design Ramon? So I got to go up to Emeryville and they took me into this room first. First there's this hallway with just room after room after room after room. And the, I would say this hallway was probably 100 feet long with all these rooms. And we start in the first room and it's all the uh, storyboards for the film. And it starts from the first scene and all these artists that work for them, they create all the artwork for the entire film is laid out through all these films. And I got to go in there with, with these storyboard artists and each artist acts out the whole scene that they illustrated. So it's one scene and another scene and they all acted out and they're being the characters of it. So I got to know the characters. And then once the, the first artist does his or her scene, then everybody gives their two cents. What if it happens, what if this happens? What if this happens? So then they write down on uh, post-it notes and they put it up there and that's what the artists go back and they'll change it. And they spend two and a half years just creating the story. And then from the, all the story is where the characters start to evolve. So I got to see the whole film acted out by each of the artists and then he asked me to create the graphics for Lightning McQueen at the end of the film. They had already created everything that he started, the first film, the first Lightning McQueen. But at the end, when Ramon custom paints him, that was my work. And there was actually three paint jobs in that. And then the second film, I got to design all the graphics for Lightning McQueen and for the 59 Impala and uh, all, some of the other characters I got involved with. But I got a phone call from John Lasseter one day and he says, hey, we're taking the old parking lot of Disneyland and we're gonna build Radiator Springs, which was the town in the film. And he says, would you paint a hard hat for me to do the groundbreaking? He says, I'm gonna bring in a big, sh a big tractor and we're gonna scoop up the, you know, the first scoop. And he says, and I'd like you to be there. Okay. So I painted a hard hat. He, he said he wanted the hard hat to be painted like Ramon, purple with the flames. So I painted that and I met him there. And after he did the groundbreaking, we took all these photos. He came over, he put his hand on my shoulder and he says, I need your help here. I said, what do you need me for? He says, well, Cheech Marin is the voice of Ramon, but you are his talent and we're building his town. He says, what I would like you to do is you can come in anytime you want to the construction of this land. And anything you see that you think Ramon would have had his hands on, that's your job. So for two and a half years, I went in there and anything that I wanted to custom paint, I'd just say, send that to the shop, send that to the shop, send that to the shop. And we'd paint these things and, and it was an absolute pleasure to do all of that. And then the last two months of construction, I took four of my pinstriping friends and we went in there and we striped everything we could. <laughs> and then I was lucky enough to get involved with, I got to go to all of the meetings for the food that was gonna be created and sold there, all of the costumes that were designed for each of the restaurants. Uh, I got to design some of the merchandise that would be sold in the stores there. And it, it was phenomenal to be involved with them. And then all of the hoods that are painted, that are custom painted and hanging Ramones, well, then they made custom pins for each of those hoods. And it was, it was just an absolute pleasure to be involved. And since then, John Lasseter has, he's no longer involved with Pixar or Disney. He's over at Skydance. And I'm, I'm involved with him right now on a film that's about cars again. So I'm, ha I'm having a blast again. Bruce, do we have time for one or two more? Uh, Chip, uh, first of all, we're honored to have you in Cartersville, and uh, thank you so very much. It's my, my question, pleasure. Well, my question for you is that you've never heard of Cartersville, you've never heard of the Savoy, and now, then all of a sudden it makes your radar. Give us your impressions, your first impression of the Savoy before you ever got here, and then now your thoughts and or comments about our town and our uh, museum. Well, for those of you that came over for Brian Fuller's exhibit, uh, Brian worked with us at Foos Design and also, you know, I was a friend of Brian before he ever came to work with me. He was working for some other hot rod shops. 
But then he also worked on overhauling with us. And Brian called me, he says, I'm having this uh, exhibit at the Savoy Autom Automotive Museum. What's Savoy? I had never heard of it. And I thought, well, that sounds cool. So I, I thought I'd come back and came and I was completely blown away. This place is beautiful and amazing. And when they asked if I, if I would do a display here, it's really, truly an honor. So it's my pleasure to be here. And it's one of the most beautiful automotive museums uh, or just museum that I've ever seen. It, it's, it's fantastic. Pleasure to be here. Uh, this is really my night. Everybody that knows me knows this is my life dream. I have been able to see and meet you. My question is, is your given name is not Chip. How did you get Who, who knows that? what my name is? I do. I do. <laughs> and I know your birthday. Now tell me why you got the name Chip. <laughs> well, my legal name is Douglas. I know Douglas. And, and my dad is the one that wrote Douglas on the birth certificate. But I, I don't remember what the problem was that when I was born, we stayed in the hospital for four days. But when I was born, my mom said that I had huge cheeks and looked like a chipmunk. So the minute she saw me, she called me Chipper. But my dad said, no. He had a good, a, a good friend of his was named Douglas who's this big, burly guy, and he says, no, I want this big, burly guy's name. <laughs> He's not a little chipper, but chip, or chipper is what, what stuck, and I didn't know my name was Douglas until I went to kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> Teacher called roll, and at the end of roll call, she says, anybody here that, that I didn't call your name? And I said, yeah, here. What's your name? And I said, Chipper. She says, what's your last name? And I said, Foos. She says, oh, you're Douglas. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> and, and I went home that day and I told my mom, I said, the teacher says my name is Douglas. She says, well, Douglas is your legal name, but you go by Chipper. <laughs> and it wasn't until ninth grade that I went to the big school, high school, and I thought, well, I better be going by Doug here. So on all my artwork and everything, I went by Doug the first year of high school. And by second year, I went back to Chipper. I liked it better. And it was interesting, while I was in school, I also ran track and I played football. And when there was something in the, in the newspaper about you know, the game, and it, and it said uh, Chip Foos, then I would go to class and it'd be a new class, and the teacher would call roll, Doug Foos, and I'd hear, are you Chip's brother? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> okay, we got one more. One more up here. Yeah. Hi. Mic check. <laughs> okay. Hi. Like everybody else in this room, I'm a big fan of overhauling. Thank you. Um, I built the 10 models that are out there on the. Oh, those are fantastic. Case. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you had a deal with Ravel. Is there any plans to? make more models of your designs with Ravel? Well, I know Ravel is struggling a bit. I hope that there may be some more one day, but uh, I'm honored that they did that. Like I said, I'm, I'm still living my childhood. You know, M2 makes the die cast cars of cars that we've built, and Ravel was building the model kits, so I'm still three years old, you know, going Me to AMT <laughs> with my dad. <laughs> okay, thank you. So hopefully they will. Bruce, before you do your final thing, I, um, it's been my pleasure to do a number of these talks. And Chip, we've known one another a long time. You are truly unique in this business. And this was a special pleasure tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh... I want to thank everybody for coming out. And, you know, it's, I am truly blessed to making a living, to be able to make a living doing something that's 100% unnecessary. You know, <laughs> the world doesn't need a hot rod. You know, but the greatest thing about my career is it's 100% passion driven. I've, I've been extremely blessed and lucky to have had the customers that I've had that have allowed me to build their dreams. So thank you and it's an honor to share it with you here at the Savoy. 
All right, thank you, thank you very much. Um, what I would like to say is, I know you guys are gonna wanna come and get some pictures. I know we had uh, a line out here with people that didn't quite get their picture taken with Chip. If you would respect and let those people who didn't get their picture taken, get uh, let them take their picture first, we'd appreciate that. So um, thanks for coming out, and uh, we'll see you at the next uh, program. I wanna say hey. hi to Wayne. <laughs>